Joe Brockmeyer, tell us about how a developer gets uh, coverage. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, what I want to talk about is how you can bootstrap coverage of your project. How many folks are working on an open source project of some sort? Okay, good. So this is going to be relevant to at least most of you. How, have you, how many of you are with a small company that want coverage of some sort? Okay. And big companies. Anybody with the one, two? Okay. All right. So... Basically, we're, you, know, you are, are almost uh, the exact audience that I want to reach. Project developers, startups, open source contributors. So what the talk is going to be about, um, basically, first of all, is reach, reaching the uh, widest relevant audience possible for your project. Uh, relevant is very important, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when we were, uh, had the talk yesterday about Jenkins, you know, he talked about finding new users and developers. This is one of the ways you get people into your project. They have to hear about it before they actually download and try it. Um, I'm going to talk about working with the press to tell your project story and how to give you a toolkit that you can tell your story on your own. You can't always count on the press to carry the story for you, um, especially really small projects. And talk will be about 29 minutes, so I'm going to try to make it less than that. So. Do so, because there should be Q&A. Make it 20. Yeah, all right. So why I love developers. Um, I actually got into uh, writing about tech and open source uh, because I discovered Linux midway through my journalism program at university. Um, and believe it or not, um, developers and press are much more alike than you may think. Um, I know it's, it's hard to imagine that developers could live the glamorous, sexy lifestyle of tech press, but really, you know, they're very similar things. What most of you want to do is not be bothered, right? You want to sit, you want to do your code, you want to get your project going. Me, I want to write. Everything else is a distraction. One of the things I love about working with developers as opposed to large companies is you know, I can call up James, or I can call up somebody working uh, with Twitter on a project like Bootstrap, or I can call up somebody uh, from Lanyard, and we can have a conversation that lasts 15 minutes, I can get non-bullshit answers, and I can write a story. There's no game playing, there's no, you know, um, talking points, there's no hedging. You know, most developers, if you say, I've heard this about your project. I've heard MongoDB has this problem. I talked to the 10 Gen guys, and they were actually surprisingly candid. I like that sort of thing. I hate dealing with PR people most of the time. There are probably five competent PR people in North America, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I'm not joking. Uh, if you, if you want to check this out, I'll put the slides online. If you want to check out that video, another uh, guy who's on a press list with me knocked up this video using, um, I can't remember the thing, where you knock up videos with uh, two or three characters. It is hilarious, and this is my life. So whenever I talk to somebody who's working on an open source project, something that's thrown up on GitHub, that makes my day, because it's so much more fun. Rule number one above everything else, if you want coverage and attention for your project, do something wonderful. There is no amount of PR juice that can help you if your project sucks, okay? Even if you get glowing coverage, somebody is going to go to your website and download the code, and then they're going to find out it sucks. So the first thing you need to do is to do something really good that you're proud of and people will care about. Next thing, you need to figure out your target audience, okay? If you're doing Jenkins, you don't want to talk to the same folks as people who are doing front-end web development, necessarily. Uh, if you are doing kernel development, if you're doing something you know, really super technical, you don't want to talk to web developers and vice versa. Find out what they want. Um, and one of the reasons target audience is really you know, kind of a resonant thing for me, I write for three or four channels on Read, Write, Web. I write for cloud, I write for hack, and I write for enterprise mostly, occasionally for mobile. I get pitches every day about funding, about people who get a promotion, about people who are, you know, USB-driven skillets. Um, I don't care. My life would be so much better if I got targeted pitches. So if you know who your target audience is and what they want, that will help you decide who to contact and what they want to hear. This defines your promotional materials, uh, what kind of things you're going to put on your website. and. Eventually, it defines your project itself. When I was with OpenSUSE, I spent two years working with Novell as the OpenSUSE community manager. 
And when I got to Novell, they were in a serious identity crisis. They had no idea who they wanted to reach with OpenSUSE. Were they trying to reach hardcore developers? Were they trying to reach uh, application developers? Did they want end users? These are not all the same thing. You don't get the same users for Ubuntu that you get for Fedora. You don't get the same users for Debian that you get for Gentoo. And if you don't know which users you want, often the users that you get that you reach out to will be very disappointed. If people expected Ubuntu and they installed OpenSUSE 11.0, they were very disappointed. So. You need to have realistic goals and measure progress. Um, you need to decide, you know, what are the target publications I want to be carried in? What's going to make me happy? Is one article a year going to make me happy? Is one article every time I do a major release going to make me happy? Keep a list of your coverage. How many folks use Fedora? One person. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, the Fedora project does a very good job of watching all of the coverage that comes out about Fedora and sending it to their marketing list and keeping, I think they keep it on their wiki too. Um, OpenSUSE project did that when I was with them. Monitor social media, keep a, you know, keep a Google target search for, have a, by the way, have a project name that isn't, um, you know, A is descriptive of your project and B is unique. Um, who was talking about Celery yesterday? Um, Simon was from Lanyard. Celery is, from his description, a wonderful project. It's a terrible project name because, you know, when you're trying to look on Google for how many, how many times is this mentioned, you're kind of going to get a lot of false uh, positives on that one. Have Lanyard, the, with that spelling, is a great project name because it's descriptive, it, it evokes what you're, you know, what you're looking at, and it's a unique spelling. So when I do a search for it, I know I'm going to find mostly references to the Lanyard project. Next step, have a reasonably decent website. Uh, from my perspective, just having a project on GitHub is not enough. It's great to have a good readme MD on GitHub. It's great to have you know, uh, a good list of what you do with the project on GitHub, but have a regular website too. Uh, include everything a person would reasonably want to know about your project. Uh, this includes the founders, the main developers. One of the things I hate is if I write an article and I say, you know, main developer so-and-so, and some guy like creeps out, he's like, I'm also a developer, but his name appears nowhere on anything, you know. Um, provide a contact and be responsive. Here is one of the, you know, facts of life for tech press. I write three or four stories a day, okay. I don't have a lot of time, uh, you know, waiting for people to respond if I'm going to ask them questions at all. If you do a project announcement, and it is straightforward, I'm probably not even going to bother to try to contact you at all. I'll write off your blog post, I'll write off what's on the, on the site, I may install and download the software and try it out depending on what it is. Um, there is not a lot of time. If I do contact you, if there is something that is controversial, and we'll get to that in a little bit, you need to be available by email pretty quickly. Um, Provide screenshots, provide description. This isn't just for tech press. This is for people who are interested in your project. If you have a GUI type application at all, one of the things that is the most annoying in the world is to go to the website and not have any idea what it looks like and have to install it before I see that the UI is hideous. Um, or isn't, but I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You want to know what a project is going to look like before you try it out. So there are rules to working with the tech press. Is that you? Yeah, about 10 pounds ago. Um, I highly recommend this document. This is not going, the whole thing does not apply to most, uh, to most developers. This was written with PR folks in mind, but I strongly recommend it anyway. Uh, if nothing else, this will give developers some sympathy for the people who are writing in the tech press, because this is what we deal with every day. Um, you know, People who will simultaneously send me an email, a note on Twitter, and call me to ask if I got the note on Twitter and the email. Um, you've probably dealt with management like this. All PR junior staffers are like this. So somebody was asking yesterday, okay, so do we need a press release? In the sense of the typical press release, the answer is a very firm no. You do not need the standard boiling, uh, the corporate boilerplate crap that people send out to this day. You don't need to prep something to go out on the wire. 
What you need is a standard project announcement that tells me in the first paragraph what your project is, what it does, and why this matters. So what you're announcing, okay? And you need to have that in the first paragraph. You need to use a descriptive email. Uh, you know, if your subject is not, you know, I get hundreds of emails a day just like all of you. If the subject does not catch my attention, the odds are I'm going to delete or file that message without even reading the first graph. If the first graph doesn't catch me, I'm not reading any farther. Uh, again, I write three to four stories a day, but I get 50 pitches a day. So there's a lot to pick from. When should you contact press? Um, if you're working on a project and you have a release coming up, how soon should you get in touch with somebody? I would say 72, 48 hours at a minimum. A week would be better if you have a release coming up. Uh, if you're doing like James was doing, trying to get coverage of uh, Monkey Gras, you need to contact well before, obviously, to, to get stuff in so people see it in time to go to the conference. Um, if you're doing something longer out, contact longer out. But I get too many people who contact me the day of an event or the day of a release and hope that I'm going to cover something. By the time I wake up tomorrow morning, I know what stories I'm writing. Unless something is really interesting, you're going to lose because I've already got my coverage planned for tomorrow unless something happens you know, really drastic. Um, for example, I wrote two stories earlier this week on OpenStack, and I had been working on those for a week, and I wasn't going to bump those off uh, for a project release I just heard about. Once somebody does write about you, you can guarantee further coverage by spreading the coverage that you get. Sad fact of life for tech press, we are often measured by our performance on page views. This means that you can kind of help out getting future coverage by spreading press about you. So if, you know, assuming the press that you get is favorable, you might want to use social media and so forth to spread the coverage and get more people to go read it. Again, Fedora does this really well. Anytime I've ever written about Fedora, I get tons of traffic. Um, partly because that community really likes to read about itself and they like to point out errors. Um, you should, if you see coverage about your project, especially if you, weren't, um, if you weren't talking to the press beforehand, send them a note, say thank you for the coverage. Um, you know, volunteer to be around if they have any further questions. Um, and also just in general, you wanna strike up a conversation with the tech press that are relevant to you. Um, there are some people that work with certain projects that I cover that I talk to regularly, whether or not there's a story that I'm working on immediately. And the reason for that, on their part, other than the fact that some of them are just people that I would hang out and have a beer with anyway. But the reason for that on their end is they want to know that they can pick up the phone or they can send me an email and they will have my attention. And they do that by having a relationship with me before they want something, okay? And on my end, I like to talk to people because I like to have a sense of what's going on. I like to write about OpenStack now because I have an idea what's going on in that community and I feel like I know what's going on so I can write about it with a little more authority than writing about something that I just heard about 15 minutes ago. I know who the players are, I know who's contributing and who's not, um, and it's much more fun to write about those topics. So, you get coverage and you find out that there is a glaring error or two or three. This happens. These are bugs and that's the way to look at them. Approach these the same way you would want someone to file a bug report with your project, i.e. politely. Um, so yesterday had a little error in the lanyard story because there was a typo on the agenda. I carried that forward into the story and I misspelled Simon's last name. He was very polite. He contacted me, said, you know, hey, can you please correct this? Great. There are people who do not react that way. Um, you I'll know, take full responsibility for that fuck up. <laughs> Get another one. That's, that's, that's down to me, people. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I take responsibility because it was my job to double check and I didn't. But I really appreciated that he, A, pointed it out. He didn't suffer silently and just think, oh, goddamn tech press, they suck. And, you know, well, maybe he thought that, but he still was polite. And, you know, he was polite about it. And he, I do appreciate when people point out errors, believe it or not, because I want to get things right. But again, three, four stories a day. It's just like writing code. You're going to make mistakes. 
Anybody in here who's ever committed code that is completely bug free, I guess you, could, you, you're, you have room to criticize, but probably you haven't. Everybody makes mistakes in their job. The difference is if you're in the press, you're in full view of everybody when you do it. Um, but again, I do appreciate when people let me know their errors in a story. So one of the things that James and I talked about a little bit was, you know, do you even need tech press? Um, for some projects, you may not, okay? Look at Apple. I mean, obviously, nobody here is working for Apple, but look at, you know, they don't really need to play nice with the tech press. They get coverage anyway. There are certain projects that when they are important enough or interesting enough, like Hadoop, they don't necessarily need somebody out there talking about them to get coverage. If you have a really wonderful, exciting project and it gets word of mouth, it gets up on Hacker News, you start to spread information about the project without necessarily working directly with the tech press. Um, so there are ways to do that. One is social media. Make sure that if you have a project, even if you don't like Facebook, even if you don't like Twitter or whatever social media you don't like, claim the names of your project and claim your personal name on all of those social media, if for no other reason than to prevent people impersonating your project at some point. Um, but I also, I included this specifically because I saw this this morning and I thought it was a really good thing to, to drive home. Uh, can everybody read this? I'll go ahead. I genuinely believe these two, don't be a dickhead and everything you post is public are all you need from a social media policy. Um, I want to call out the second part of that in particular. I hope everyone in here is of a mindset not to be a dickhead. But uh, everything you post is public. Everything you do in your project is PR. Everything you do in your project is fair game for someone to write about. Uh, so pay close and particular attention to that. I've had people who write a post about a project and they flame a project or they take a stand on something. It gets up on Hacker News and then someone writes about it and they cry because that was my personal blog. You weren't supposed to write about that. It's all flat. Anything you put up on your blog has just as much chance of getting worldwide coverage as anything I write on Read Write Web. All right, so that is basically the presentation in a nutshell. And I, James wanted me to leave time for Q&A. Do I have time for Q&A? You did good. You were just winding me up with that 29 minutes, weren't you? Yes. You just did that to, to mess with me. <laughs> yes. Um, so it seemed, it's interesting. I know that, that Untapped uh, might have some questions. They're, they're, they're giving you some plus one. And Matt from Bitly. So, are there any questions um, about for for Joe? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, the question for the cameras and the audio is: What's my take on exclusivity? Um, I think exclusivity should be earned, okay? I broke a story this week, uh, as far as I know I broke it, on OpenStack dropping Hyper-V and on Red Hat's involvement with OpenStack. I earned an exclusive on that, even though I didn't put in big letters exclusive. I didn't, earn, I didn't get an exclusive because somebody called me just because my blog happens to have a larger, larger readership and that's the only way they can get mentioned. So I think exclusivity is overrated. Uh, and I think that you probably shouldn't participate in that system. That's what I think of it. That's a big statement. So. Anyone else? Okay. And by the way, if somebody contacts me, I don't want you to contact me and say, I'm going to give you something exclusively. So. Well, you actually want to do work? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other questions? I mean, Joe's going to be around as well. If, if I mean, sometimes British audiences, they like to ask that question in the pub rather than in the room. Oh, uh, there's ah, one way in the back. No, notice that it's actually not an Englishman that's asking the question. Zach, <laughs> here, let me bring you the mic. Oh. You can see I'm really good at this. Hi, Joe. Hey. Um, I edited a magazine for a while, uh, and I've written for Read Right Web in the past as well. And I've had lots of people... Uh, end up sending me things completely unsolicited, like, please write about this. Uh -huh. um, I get randomly things saying, this is embargoed. And I mean, they're usually bullshit anyway. I don't really want to write about them anyway. Yeah. Um, and they're not things I would write about. Uh, how do you handle things like embargo for this kind of the tech industry publications? Sure. By the way, what was your name? Zach. Zach, good to meet you. Um, 
So how do I handle embargoes? So this is my general policy, and this varies a lot. I will generally agree to an embargo um, with a couple of provisos. Number one, I'm not going to embargo anything that's public knowledge. So if you want to contact me and say, hey, you know, even though the OpenStack roadmap is out in public view, we'd like to embargo this release that we're, you know, going to release it. It's like, no. Um, I don't necessarily automatically agree to an embargo if someone sends it to me embargoed without asking first. Uh, there are PR people that I tell them, by default, just send me stuff. Don't make me do a round trip. But you do need to have that relationship with somebody. In general, I'm not a big fan of embargoes because really that's just press theater. I mean, it's basically... The whole thing is, you know, we're going to try to get coverage from something, and we try to orchestrate all of this stuff going on, and we want 5,000 articles about something on the same day. I think it's a horrible system, and it's not. Here's, here's the dirty secret to that, too. When I work with Novell, we launched, how many folks have heard of SUSE Studio? Okay, still not that many. This is interesting. Um, we did a big, they did a big press uh, push on SUSE Studio and they got great coverage. Every single major tech publication that you would want to be mentioned in mentioned SUSE Studio. And look at years later how, many, how few hands went up that people heard it. And these are the people, this room is the people who should have heard about it. So good press is a long sustained campaign. It is not bursty. Um, so yeah, not a big fan of embargoes. You know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, what do I do with the content? Um, basically, I don't, I don't generally like break the embargo unless there's a good reason. Now, like I said, if somebody, if I have a story and somebody sends me a little more information, I didn't agree to an embargo, I feel free to use that. Um, here's the other thing. I've been doing tech press for 13 years. I really am not one of those people that wants to burn folks or, or you know, do anything just to get a story because I think relationships are more important. Uh, there are other tech press that don't. Always assume if you don't actually know somebody in the tech press, they are not your friend. Um, be very careful what you say to them and don't ever go off the record with somebody you don't know really well because there really is no such thing. I just threw that one in on your question, sorry. Cool. Any others? And we'll make this the last one if there are any more. Steve, hang on a second. Let me read the mic. <laughs> this way they get it on they get it on camera or on the <laughs> tape. Because this is gonna be the hottest one out there. Come on, read right <laughs> web is gonna drive the traffic. <laughs> the pressure is on. Yeah, there's the, there's one point about embargoes though, which which haven't worked on both sides of the fence. Yeah. Um, certainly, we have situations where we have to translate press releases into God knows how many different languages. Mm -hmm. And we need to give the press a heads up that this is coming. Sure. Also, you've got to brief your internal guys as well as what's coming along. So there is a sort of balance, and sometimes you actually embargo it so you can get it out to the press guys so they know what's coming. But you've actually got to brief your internal guys about this is what we're going to say. Sure. Especially if you're trying to be a bit more controversial about stuff. Uh, so it kind of works. What, kind, what size company are you talking about, though? Oh, it's, a, it's a big one. Yeah, see, that's kind of the difference. Here I'm referring to... You know, small the, guys shouldn't be small guys. embargoes. No. Yeah, no. And big companies do press releases for totally, totally different reasons. I used to argue at Novell a lot about the press releases. And uh, Ian, the guy who was director of PR there kept schooling me on that. He's like, the press release isn't for the press. The press release is for investors. The press release is for the board. <laughs> you know, um, in, Unless you have investors and a board to worry about, don't worry about the wire type press release. Mm. So, yeah, good point. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, your attention after such a long night last night. Thank you.